What's up, I'm Ujemma and welcome back to my channel. In this video, I wanna walk through JavaScript scopes and closures. Though they might not be considered the most beginner-friendly concepts, in this video, I wanna focus on the basic information that you need just to get a high level understanding of them. So by the end of this video, you should know what scopes and closures are, why they exist, and how to take advantage of them inside of any of your coding projects. I left timestamps down in the description box below so you can click around and watch the portion of the video that you care about the most. So with all of that, let's define what a scope is. So a scope in JavaScript in any modern programming language is a lexical environment that's created when you create a variable or a method. Scopes define when variables and methods have access to other variables and methods inside of your code. At a super high level, there are two scopes that I want to focus in on for this video. So the first scope is the global scope, which is the very top level of your application. In theory, any function or variable has access to your global scope. So if you're running JavaScript inside your browser, the global scope is considered to be the page that you're running all of your JavaScript code inside of. All of the files, all the functions that you create have access to that global scope. If you want to look at a code block, we can look at this example that I came up with. So here we have our name, which is set to Regina King, and it's in our global scope, meaning it's it's defined at the very top level of our file. And then the function right beneath it called print name inside uses the name constant to print out the string inside name and then Regina King. So far, not too complicated. Variables and methods throughout our application have access to the global level of our code. And then the second scope is your local scope. So any variable or function that's defined inside of another function is bound to that local scope. That means certain variables and methods don't have access to the internal data defined in other functions throughout our code. So what that means is if we create a function and we have variables and methods inside that function, anything outside of that function doesn't have access to the internal data. So going back to the code block, I move my name constant variable outside of the global scope into my print name scope. So I'm still able to print out the name Regina King inside of my print name function, but now when I try to reference the name variable outside of print name, I'm gonna have an error thrown saying that I don't have a reference to name. So let's take a quick intermission to understand why it's so important to understand how scopes work in JavaScript. Scopes allow developers to organize their code in ways that promote optimized and secure coding practices. Scopes limit certain blocks of code's reach to other variables and methods throughout your code. And this is really beneficial because it limits parts of your code to only access other pieces of your code that it truly needs to execute its instructions. So scopes promote organized and secure code and also by the end of the day, just clean and easier to read code. So now that we have that in mind, let's look at lexical scope. So lexical scope in JavaScript is basically the concept of having nested scopes where the child scope has access to its parent scope, which has access to its parent scope, and that bubbles all the way up to the top or the global scope. So here in this code block, I have my method called grandmother and I have a constant name variable with the value Diana Ross. And then I have another method inside grandmother called mother that also inside of itself has another method called daughter. Inside of my daughter method, I'm able to actually print out my grandmother's name, even though I'm inside of a different function scope. So since name was defined in a parent scope to our daughter method, I'm able to grab hold of it. But neither my grandmother nor my mother methods have access to my daughter's hobbies array. This is because the access of variables and functions and scopes is a bottom-up approach rather than a top-down approach. So now that we have a better idea of what scope looks like inside JavaScript, I want to tackle one of the most confusing parts about JavaScript in my opinion, which is the difference between let and var. You've probably been told during your journey of learning JavaScript to prioritize using let and const over var, but you weren't completely sure why. The reason for this is var doesn't create a new block scope. In other words, what that means is if you create a var variable inside block statements like if else, switch statements, or even for and while loops, you have access to that var variable outside of those block statements, which honestly to me is really confusing to read. So I'm gonna show you a code block of this happening. So here in my print name method, I have an if block statement, and inside the block statement, I create a new var variable called name, and then it sets the value of Regina King. What's interesting about this is that it feels like you shouldn't have access to the variable name, especially since we looked at other code blocks where you don't have access to the contents of functions if you're outside of that function. But in this code block, I'm able to print out the variable name even though it was defined inside of a block statement. Let is always prioritized over var. 
it's not only bound to the scope that it's defined in, but it's also bound to the block statement that's defined in. So let's look at the same code block, but instead of using var variables, I'm gonna use a let variable. So again, I have my if block statement, and instead of using var, I use let. So now when I try to print out a name, I'm actually gonna get an undefined. Name's just not created. So this makes a lot more sense to me. I feel like if you create any variable or method inside of curly brackets, then anything outside of that curly brackets shouldn't have access to whatever is inside the curly brackets. So let's take a look at another example, but in this case, I'm gonna throw an error. So in my function my error, inside I have a try catch block, and then inside my try block, I create a new var variable called name with Regina King, and then right after that, I throw a new error. So because var variables are accessible at the function level rather than the block level, I'm able to access our name variable inside of our catch block. So to proponents of var variables, this would be considered a win because you're able to access the name variable inside different block scopes. But this again is very confusing to read. You shouldn't have access to a variable that's defined in a different block scope. What I would expect to happen is that I will throw an error if I try to access a variable that doesn't exist inside of my immediate block scope. So instead of using a var variable so you can use it in both the try and catch blocks, you can just create a new let variable and define it outside of your try catch block so both your try catch blocks have access to that top level let variable. So now that we have a better idea of scopes like the global scope and the local scope and even how variables are bound to scopes, what can we do with this information? There's a concept in JavaScript called closures, which takes advantage of the lexical environment or scopes that we were talking about throughout this video. Closures enable developers to create functions that have access to other variables and methods that aren't immediately in its scope. So according to the MDN definition, a closure is the combination of a function bundled together with references to its surrounding state. So in other words, a closure is a persisted scope that holds on to the local variables and methods that were defined in the scope that was already executed. So this all might sound pretty nebulous, so I'm gonna walk you through a code block to make this a little bit more concrete. So I create a function named outer, which creates a message constant along with an arrow function named inner. Inner has access to all the variables and methods that were defined in its outer outer scope, or more specifically, the outer function scope. After all of that, I call outer and assign the return value to my callback variable. So now anytime I call the method callback, since it now is a function, I still have access to the outer method scope without necessarily knowing which variables and methods existed in that function when it was first defined. To look at another example, let's see how this could work when using the array methods for each function. So I have an array of names and I iterate over it with the for each method. Inside for each, I pass in the reference to my iterator method called my function. For each will call the iterator function on each of the items that it comes across inside of our array. And this is really convenient for for each. It doesn't need to know what's going on inside my function. All it knows is that it can call that function and get a return value that it can include in its final array. So Clojure gives you so much freedom as to when and where you can call predefined code. And that's it for JavaScript scopes and closures. I know it's not the most beginner friendly topic to cover, but I think it's super important to know how scopes and closures work. It just enables you to further optimize and organize and secure your code. Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please drop a like and subscribe to the channel for more content. You can ask me questions about scopes and closures down in the comment section below. And also let me know if there's anything that you want me to cover in the future. I'm also on Twitter where I tweet about anything that I want to tweet about that moment in time, you can send me a DM and we can have a nice chat. And with that, I'll see you all in the next video.